Hello, welcome to another episode of Not Too Deep. I'm your host, Grace Helbig. I'm very excited today. We have Mike Johnson with us on the podcast. You might know him from Hannah Brown's season of The Bachelorette um, or Bachelor in Paradise, but he's also on top of that an author with a new book coming out called Making the Love You Want. We talk about writing the book, which is incredibly powerful. So go pick it up when it comes out in October. We talk about his process to get to writing the book. We hear all about the the goofs and the spoofs on the set of The Bachelorette. And, uh, you know, h- how he got to the place of even applying for the job, what he would have done differently. And the surprising celebrity that he gets mistaken for. Enjoy this episode of Not Too Deep with Mike Johnson. Mike, 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 I'm very excited that you're here. Thank you for now, having me, Grace. Of course, of course. Now, um, for guests that I have on the podcast that have sort of like hybrid kind of careers, I, I like to ask them, um, what's your deal? What's your deal? Like, yeah. Straight up, how, your deal? <laughs> how would you describe, let's say hypothetically, an alien came down and uh, you're introducing yourself to this alien. How would you describe what it is that you do and how you exist in the world? A very oh. light question to start off with, by the way. <laughs> no, I love it. Come hit me right off the bat. Yeah. Uh, so I would, I would tell Elon Musk. Because he's okay. Alien. Yes, yes. <laughs> I would say, bro, I'm just a dude that want to make people happy. I wrote a book that will teach them how to find the love that they want i'm an author first and then you know i did some pretty cool things trying to find love and you know be around the world in the military uh amazing now this is what i want to kind of go back to uh you growing up you uh, are in the military for how long i did eight years total i was like four and a half five years active duty and i did three and a half years in the guard okay and how long after the military did we get to the bachelorette um, I would say from active duty to the bachelorette was about five years. Okay. Yeah. And my, my biggest question, obviously, and I'm sure you've answered this a thousand times over is what happens in that time period that gets you to the doorstep of the bachelorette? No one's asked it in that way, Grace. So okay. right there. thank Kudos. you. <laughs> uh, what happened in that time period? You know, I fell in love, got mm-hmm. my heart broke. I grew up a little bit, became uh-huh. introspective. Learned a lot from my mistakes. And then I was like, you know, bachelorette. Yeah. Did uh, did you apply for the bachelorette? I, we were just had last yeah. week, uh, Caitlin Bristol was talking with us. And we went through like her whole bachelor, bachelorette journey. Uh, operative word is journey. How, how did your application go? Did you apply? Did producers find you? Yeah, I wish I could say that. They found your boy, you know, they was, I was on the <laughs> and they just saw me at Target or something, but yeah. it didn't work out that way. My homeboy actually told me to apply because I, there was, okay. So the story is mm-hmm. I was at work. I was financial advisor. I was at work one day and I got annoyed and I kind of just threw my phone down or whatever. Yeah. Like, what's wrong with you, bro? I'm like, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'm tired of like, not having a girl, I want. I want to be in a relationship. Like I'm, I'm over my ex. I'm over uh-huh. that situation completely. You know, I have. You're ready. Girls, yeah, I have girls that hit me up, but like, one thing or another happens. I'm like, I just, I want the real thing. I'm ready for it. And he just started laughing. Like he <laughs> a was good like, friend. One guy like a ever really good that? friend. <laughs> yeah, he's like, well, from a guy's perspective, he was just like, bro, you, why, why, why do you want a girlfriend? Like he mm-hmm. was just laughing his ass off. Sure. He couldn't figure out why. And then, um, like, six months later, he said, you should apply for this show. Wow. So That's he cool. is the one to blame. Had you watched the show before you applied? I had watched one episode before I applied. And okay. that was in 2017. I had lived at these apartments downtown San Antonio. Mm-hmm. And I would come home really late uh, from work. I was a financial advisor, had a suit on every day. And I had, like, the, the little player spot like the really dope single guy spot right yeah a bachelor pad um, yeah the bachelor pad <laughs> and my my uh neighbor she actually thought i was an escort <laughs> really <laughs> my neighbor 
I'm like, just, why? Yeah, just because you had a nice apartment. She said, and I, I asked her, I'm like, why? Of all the jobs that yeah. I had to be an escort. And she's like, well, you're always in a suit. You're <laughs> never you're never home on the weekend. You, and when you do come home, it's really late at night. Uh-huh. And I know how much your apartment costs. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, of all the things, I'm an escort. Like, that's what your brain goes to, escort. Yeah, but, um, I mean, it was either international spy or escort, and right. escort for some reason is more believable. Wow, what a creative brain your neighbor has! Definitely does. <laughs> but um, so they invited me over for the uh, like a bachelor viewing party. Which okay, I didn't know what those were at the time. Mm-hmm. So I go to the party or whatever, you know, chilling with everybody, and my neighbor Ashley, she said, "I'm going to be the bachelor one day," and like that was the only episode I had ever watched was just chilling with them. Wait, she said that you were going to be the bachelor one day. She did, yeah. Wow. What a what a strange and specific prediction for a friend to make randomly. <laughs> but hey, hey here right. you are now. Uh, I'm sure some of your friends said you would be a a host. And, uh, something, yeah, that I could potentially make people laugh in some capacity. Um yeah. well, the thing I love reality television show. I'm not a major, major bachelor, bachelorette person, but I did see your season. And you, as a contestant, were so striking because um, one, you're wildly charming, but two, you also have such a wonderful bullshit meter that goes off and calls people out in such a real way that I just kept wondering how, why is this real person on a reality show? This person's too <laughs> real to be participating in this nonsense. Facts, and facts. I appreciated that very, very much. And thank you for doing that. Um, did you know in those moments, I mean, cause you guys are all sequestered and it's a experience that's I'm sure so completely hard to relate to. Good from anyone. Yeah. But I mean, I'm so fascinated by it because it is like a social experiment in a way. Uh, did you know that you were like reaching a breaking point in those moments or were you just being yourself and calling out bullshit as you saw it? I'm just calling out the bullshit as it came. <laughs> Thank as, you. Like, <laughs> as it would come along, I'm like, bro, what is this? Like literally they, they cut this out, which I'm in retrospect, I'm probably glad they cut it out. Okay. But the, I was one of the, I was the first limo to meet Hannah Brown. Mm-hmm. And I think I was the third person they come out and there was 30 of us coming out that night yeah and during the limo entrance one of the guy one of the guys come in and i just go i just i let him have my thoughts <laughs> like immediately and we're friends now but oh, good. he had said something to the lines of hannah you're from the south will you let me go down south or something like that wow and i was like bro like we're here to find love like if you meet her dad like <laughs> Like, what? why would you say that? And so yeah. I was still under the impression that, well, I still am to this very second under the impression that this was a show to find love. Yeah, that's and, a very pure and genuine thought. <laughs> yeah, like, I'm I'm just an innocent guy over here thinking, like, bro, I'm trying to find love. Yeah. What are you saying that for, you know? So I appreciate you saying that I have a bullshit meter because... I'm calling like I see it. Well, you know, it's really interesting. Reality TV, as you probably know, and as a fan of it, you can see when people are using a show for their own means rather than for like the premise of the show. And so it is really refreshing to know that you just came in there purely for the idea of finding love when a lot of other people are going in for a wide variety of reasons, I'm sure. Um, That said, what what were like the... What's the best thing about the experience and what was, uh, I don't want to say worst, but a a curious part of the experience? Uh, Curious part of the experience. (laughs) Yeah, something that sticks with you, but not necessarily for the best reasons. That's like when uh, one of your friends shows you something that you think is ugly and you're like, (laughs) yeah, you you made a choice with that shirt. Cool. Yeah, that's a a wonderful choice. (laughs) I would say the, the best part of the show or my best time, my best experience was when I got to play rugby with the guys. Yeah. That was like super fun. And I have so much more respect for rugby players. Your cardio has to be like top notch mm-hmm. above and beyond. That was really fun. And then to, I mean, it's a bunch of alpha guys when we're pent up 
oh, got yeah. some aggression amongst each other. So we get to alleviate that aggression was really fun. Um, that was I'm really cool. sure. Cause I also wonder, cause you guys are, are you all sharing rooms with each other? Yeah. There's about four rooms in the mansion. That, that's so nuts to me. So yeah, you guys are literally in each other's shit all day, every day. What was the experience life of like rooming with everyone while filming with everyone while seeing this girl randomly and you're not sure of what's going on? To me, I mean, it's like if if I were to date a girl out here in the real world, I in my back of my brain, if we're just going on the first date, she's obviously having first dates with someone else. That's how mm -hmm. I thought of it when I was on the show. I'm like, the only difference is I get to see my competition. Right. right? Right. In comparison to real life, I have no idea what she what what she's going after. So that made me feel like I had an advantage. Mm, that's a really that's positive way to look was. at it. Yeah, that's a very uplifting way to look at it. I don't. I'm just uplifting. I don't. It's just who I am. But that's how I looked at it, right? And then it was the only weird part was when I catch one of the guys kissing her, and mm. I, I'm, I'm like. So, bro, I gotta like, I gotta kiss her after. <laughs> yeah, that's the, that's the I only think, weird part. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I think any person that is, you know, a normal, regular person would have that reaction in their brain of being like, "Oh, come on, this isn't I, okay." Here we go. Yeah, okay. You <laughs> like you, you can't get upset because you signed up for it, and, right? But then a part of me, a part of you, whoever. Would be like you kissed that? Like really? Mm -hmm. Like you could have said no to them. <laughs> <laughs> like, you decided to kiss them. Come on now. Did you? What was the experience like watching back this season? Because it's one thing to be there and experience it, and then you get to watch without having any control over how they portray you as a person. That must have yeah. been very nerve wracking. I must be an alien too, because honestly, it wasn't that nerve wracking. <laughs> It was oh, to me. It wasn't that nerve wracking to me. I pinky promise you, I fell asleep uh -huh. on the very so. <laughs> that's great. I, I legit fell asleep on it, Man, but that's because I was there. I lived it. So it's like right. it's like when you know when we're kids and our parents like record us when we're children, mm -hmm. but like a, a perfect beautiful camera, or, you know, four K capabilities. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. Different. It's like oh yeah, I mean yeah, I did that. That's. Yeah. I don't know. That's just how my brain operates. Uh, no, I think that I think that speaks to you knowing that you're a good person, so you don't have to worry about them like editing you in a certain light that isn't favorable. Uh, that's it's nice to know that you have confidence in like your decisions and who you are. Uh, all, all parts that I acted upon were parts of who I am. That's yeah. That that's what you hope. I mean, I obviously reality TV is reality TV. It's very sensationalized, but it's always great to walk away being like, yeah, that's exactly who I am. The Bachelor Nation as a whole, though, and everyone that it comes through that show as contestants seems to have a really tight bond. What is that like after the show? Because it feels like a fraternity or a sorority. It's definitely a fraternity and sorority, one hundred percent. Yeah, like I've never been a part of one, but that's. That that's what this is like. Which I am a part of this one. I mean, I think I'm part of an amazing one, which is pretty cool to say. Mm -hmm. I know one of my uh, guy, one of my castmates from our season. We're moving in together, by the roommates. Oh, that's cute. It's cute, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. You know? So that came from the show. That's pretty cool. And I talk to all the guys all the time. I mean, I am pretty business oriented, and so therefore, a lot of the guys from the show are as well. Mm -hmm. And. I help them with their business ventures. They help me with my business ventures. That's great. You know, it, it's like a bunch of, it's a frat. Yeah, but that's nice. It's almost like collaboration in a lot of ways with people that <laughs> you have such a shared, unique experience that other people don't have. Um, what about the fans, the audience? Because uh, I have friends that are, you know, very die hard of this franchise and they're a certain type of person. Uh <laughs> any <laughs> any notable like interactions with fans that you've had over the last couple of years? I've had oh man, so many interactions. I love the best uh, fashion fans. I'm sure it's a wild spectrum of all different types of interactions. <laughs> you hit the nail on the head with that one. It is definitely a spectrum. Some things I would tell my mom. Some things I won't tell. Yeah. Them. Keep it at that. Yeah. I would okay. say the, the coolest thing that happened was I was at a. Uh, 
I was at a Post Malone concert in Dallas. Mm-hmm. And I want to say the coolest, but the most touching moment. A lady came up to me. She uh, she was crying. And I'm like, why are you crying for me? <laughs> but she, she was crying. And her man was right there, too. And he got emotional. And she was telling me that while she was in the hospital battling chemo, she was watching me on TV and just my my smile and radiated through her and it made her feel good. Wow. And after, I almost started crying. Yeah. <laughs> Yo, you got me, you know, you're choking me up right here. So that was probably uh, the most touching moment that I've had. Yeah, what a what a sweetly sensitive moment in the middle of a post Malone concert. <laughs> it was an intermission time frame. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's really cute. Um, okay, we're going to take a quick break. When we get back, I want to talk a lot about the the new book, Making the Love <clears throat> You Want, and uh, how this came to be. I mean, it seems like a very natural progression for you, but uh, I, I need to know how to make the love I want. So we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep. Not Too Deep. What's crazy? Hello listeners, Grace Helbig here, wanting to say two things. A big thank you for listening to the podcast. Uh, If you're a regular listener, if this is your first time listening, welcome and thank you. And uh, second thing, if you are enjoying yourself here in this not too deep world we've built and you'd like to leave us a review, that would be so wonderful. If you can go to the iTunes store, the app store and leave us a lovely little review comment. How are you feeling? Good, bad, otherwise? Maybe just good or otherwise would be appreciated. Other than that, enjoy the podcast. Okay, Mike, let's talk about Making the Love You Want. This is your new book that yes. is very, very exciting. How did this come about? Well, can I? So there's something that I do. I got to let out some energy of joy. Right yes. Quick. Okay. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's all the energy around this book right now? Yes, 100%. Oh, yes. That's amazing. It's like um it's not exactly a memoir, right? It's kind of, it's it's memoir mixed with actual practical advice for finding the love that you want. Correct. Yeah, I'm too okay. young for memoir, right? Like, <laughs> not necessarily. I, well, I hopefully have a good four more lifespans to go. You know, I'm only thirty two yeah. years old. I'm way too young for that. I'm an alien, remember? Me and Elon Musk. We go way back. That's true. But, so uh, who knows how long that you have to go? <laughs> Exactly. But Making the Love You Want, you know, comes out October 2nd, World Small Day. It's, oh. the, I would say the spine of the book is mm-hmm. about me directly, but then the the meat and potatoes of the book are not about me. The meat and potatoes of the book are just literature that I wrote in regards to how to find the love that you want, which is how, which translates directly to the success that you want out of life, the success mm-hmm. that you want within yourself, the confidence that you want within yourself, the grace that you need, uh, the acceptance that you need, the truth that you need, right? Mm. And when I say truth, acceptance, and uh, grace, those things can be within self or for other people around you. And within the book, it talks about, uh, well, I give mantras mm-hmm. that I personally use every single day in the mirror. I have oh, nice. monthly blackboards. Uh, <laughs> I have exercises within the book that I personally have gone through struggles. I used to have a, when I was 19 years old, mm-hmm. um, I had something, I guess you would call it this dissociative state okay. of mind. And I didn't know what was going on with me. I just know I stopped going to work. I had a girlfriend at the time. I stopped calling her. I moved back to my mom's place and just stayed in the bed every single day. And I went to the hospital. My mom made me go to the hospital. Mm-hmm. And the doctors weren't necessarily sure. They put me, you know, they gave me a CAT scan. They put all these wires to my head. And Quite honestly, they were unsure of what the issue was with me. Wow. Uh, they found out that I was a, a dissociative state of mind that I was in. Mm-hmm. And I didn't snap out of it for a while. Um, I just was, I felt like I was a vegetable, right? I was just wow. in the bed every single day. All I kept saying was my social security number because I didn't want to forget my social. Wow. Like, I was just, I couldn't think of nothing else. I was completely lost to life or whatever uh-huh. and some of the tools that I use to get through that experience and other experiences are in the book 
Uh, but I learned at that moment in time in life when I finally snapped out of it was simply that I learned from me that I can't be stagnant. And what I had going on in my life at the time, I felt that I was, as if I was being stagnant and I wasn't progressing in life. And so mm. something that individually for me, if I feel like I'm not progressing in life, I do become extremely depressed mm-hmm. and run down and just don't want to be a part of life anymore. And so sure. I know that and I've had friends that have committed suicide and I know that I myself have thought of crazy things uh, that are going through my head when I've had my depressed states and moments. Mm-hmm. And so I wrote this book to be a solution to a problem that so many people face. I think uh-huh. every single person in the entire world will go through if they haven't already gone through something that is challenging, you know, mentally mm-hmm. challenging for them. Especially and, right now. Yeah. No, definitely. So I mean, we're in a, mm-hmm. a crazy pandemic from social injustice to the country itself when it comes to coronavirus. And like right now, I can't imagine being in an abusive household and I can't leave that person right now. Right. Right. Yeah. So I think, well, obviously this book won't be able to physically help you in that regard. You need to leave the house situation, but this book definitely can help free your mind mentally Hmm. in that situation. Right. And so this book is for all people that have been through something and or are in a great track right now. Mm -hmm. But if you, ever fall back, which I personally do all the time. I think we all do. It's human. Yeah. Yeah. It's human nature. So therefore this book has the tools to get you right back to where you were. That's great. I think, uh, just having a guide, you know, is the first step to wanting to help yourself and you can take it or leave it and use it at the right moment. Like what happened with you finding the right moment to like pull yourself out of everything. How long have you been working on this book? Cause it feels like this is kind of something since you were 19 years old has been in your brain. No, definitely. So well, they, the experiences that I've gone through within this book started at about five years old. Wow, uh, okay. I'll, and I'll talk about it. It goes throughout. But I would say prior to, in 2017, I wanted to, in 2017, three things happened to people that I care and love about and care and love. And I was quite honestly, to be transparent, I was tired of the bullshit. Yeah. Like, I call it out. I yeah. was like, yo, I need to figure out a solution to this growing problem of mental illness. And so 2017, I decided to create media that would disturb the current media that we see every day now, which is, and I saw a picture, it was a girl, maybe 10 years old. She had a Vogue magazine and she had some scissors and she was hunched over like this and she was like cutting her stomach, right? Uh. Like I was just tired of the bullshit. And so back in 2017, that's when I had to start it this journey of creating a alternate media that was like, baby, you can, you can look the way you look and you're perfectly fine. Or my, my brother, my homeboy, like you can have, you can have a felony. You could have done something stupid. And now you could bounce back off of that. Right. Mm-hmm. So I've been working on that ever since. No one knows about that, but coming off the show, I mean, now everyone knows about it for surprise, <laughs> <laughs> but coming off the show, all the DMS that I got, I was just, mm with dms and i like to respond to people i can't respond to everybody right. but i like to respond to people and quite honestly the dms just continue to flow and after i would you know shut off my phone or whatever my my mind kept going and i would continue to write mm. that just day after day turned into an entire book wow how cool and also a great idea to disrupt this obviously very overwhelmingly negative media with just kind of like radical acceptance of yourself, uh, which is very, very cool. And it does feel like this book and correct me if I'm wrong is for like every age group and every gender and isn't targeted specifically towards like single women in their twenties or something like that. Thank you so much for saying that. You Uh, you get a virtual high five. I have, People that know me from The Bachelor know that my fan base is all women, right? Sure. But my book, this is a black dude that's writing the book, right? I'm a man mm-hmm. that's writing the book. So therefore, I'm also targeting my homeboys that want to read the book as well. Yeah. So it, I, I have examples of Ellen DeGeneres, who's a part of the LGBT community, right? Mm-hmm. Or I have examples of Nipsey Hussle, who's a rapper and someone that I admire and look up to, Mac mm-hmm. Miller in my book. But then I also have mathematicians in my book. I also have, uh, I talk about bell hooks in my book. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we speak, Jen Cicerino, 
we speak about so many different things within this book and I want to be able to touch everyone, not just single women. Yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want like if your brother is going through some shit, pass him my book. Yeah. Right? Like this book is for, I mean, this book has helped me. Like literally. I when I, I got called the N-word the other day and it really pissed me off. Yeah. Uh, because it happened quite a bit this day, more than most days. Like I get called names every day, but this day was a little bit more than most. And so yeah. I went back to a passage that I said in my book and I just, you know, tweeted it out or whatever and just helped me out for the situation I was going through. Um, so this book is definitely not just for a single women. This book is for everyone. You could be my mom. She's a married woman with two children. <laughs> she's gonna read, Obviously she's going to read a book because she's my mom. But yeah. like, so she, my, your mom at this moment, it. your mom hasn't read the book yet. No, which. Oh, oh is that going to be a big deal? <laughs> yeah. Cause I talk about some things that my mom and my grandma might not want to be so <laughs> happy about when I'm done. I mean, at this point, I feel like they have to be, they just know that you're going to do what you're going to do and they have oh, to sure. be okay with it. Sure. I mean, have I got they, tattoos on my arm and stuff. My mom was not happy about that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to be a great individual, a wonderful yeah. part of society. And I don't want to be, I want to be a bearing, you know, I want to divulge from the norm. And so you could be a tatted up person that has done one or two illegal things in their life that people yeah. will read about in the book, you know, <laughs> and still be a wonderful, great society, a great uh -huh. person in society. Right. And so. Yeah. When she reads this stuff, she, you know, she'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> At this point, I, uh, I I doubt that they seem very surprised by what you're doing. Um, I will ask, this red turtleneck is, <laughs> <laughs> is the stamp. Is this the this is the look. Uh, how do we how do we decide on the red turtleneck look? So I am a big, big fan. It's very catching to the eye. Um, see, that's an interesting point right yeah. there. Interesting, right? Interesting. My why a turtle got all that? Oh, it's great. You look fun. You oh. look like you're having a great time. You look very like uh, someone trustworthy. Good. I'm glad. There you go. There you go. I think I am pretty trustworthy, but I'm glad that wasn't. I wasn't going for trustworthy. Yeah. Um, my my stylist just hooked me up, and I like the outfit. I think it's great. It's very iconic. It's very memorable for everyone. Um, well, Steve Jobs wears a black turtleneck, so that's know. I I I didn't know if there was a little homage there or, or it wasn't what. at all. I just thought of that. <laughs> I mean, two geniuses. Uh, the with the way that the world has been the last few months, everything's upside down and turned around. Are there plans for a book tour, or are there like kind of creative ideas being floated around? There are creative ideas being floated around right now. Okay. I I want to see every single person that reads this book. Yeah. And I mean that. I want to be able to see every single person that reads this book. If I can't see you in person, I want to see like I'm looking at you right now, Grace. Mm -hmm. And I want to have I'm considering having a virtual book tour, like a one on one, then also like a general admission type thing. So Oh, that's cool. But then also I, I just want to see and hug everybody. I'm <laughs> Yeah. Over your person, you know, if you don't want to hug, I ain't gonna hug you. But <laughs> for those that would like a hug, I would like a hug. And so I want to be as I would love it if we were able to. Yeah, well, knock on wood. Um, and I, I think even the virtual stuff people would be super excited about. Uh, that said, pandemic and everything, uh, you on a personal level. Uh, how has this affected you? Learn anything about yourself? I've, I've learned that I'm very bad at cleaning my own home. Uh, <laughs> and it's not like something I can learn, it turns out. I just don't have like the gene that's in me still, that I lets me clean. <laughs> I don't got it. Uh, have you learned anything about yourself in the, the last few months? And coming to cleaning, yeah. I legit do this all the time. I'm like, if I have, if I order Uber Eats or something, uh -huh. And I'll, I'll get down with the wrapper. I'll just literally be on my couch and I'll just throw it. I'll just throw the wrapper. I'll, I'll pick it up later when I get up. Yeah, so there you serious. go. There you go. I've, I've picked up cycling. Oh, that's cool. Oh, also, aren't you tra uh, training for a half marathon? Yeah, I'm training for a half marathon right now. Yeah. How's that going? 
Whew, shit. It's hot. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, especially the the temperature. Yeah. It have you ever have you ever run a half marathon before? No, never. <sighs> wow. Never in my life. My homeboy Connor, he's he like signed me up for it, uh-huh. which I'm glad he did. Cause if he would have just continued like, hey, you should do this, I would have. No, I'm not doing that. Yeah. But then he like he signed me up for it, and then run Dallas. They like put me on like they put my face all over their oh. campaign. <laughs> so I was like, oh god, I gotta do it. I gotta be doing now. Now you have social accountability. Yeah. I can't play going. So I had ran a one mile the very first day uh-huh. and was like exhausted. My legs were, but now I can do like five, six miles. So that's good. There you go. Working, working at it. So I would just say I've been. It's been five months since you know COVID. Really, five, six months. Yeah. So at first, I've I've gone through my waves. At first, it was like I'm just gonna eat Oreos and. <laughs> Uh huh. Bottle of wine every night, you know. Uh huh. <laughs> and then after a while, I was like, "Look, I need to get a, I need to get a routine going because mm. this not having a routine crap is, is I become annoying, irritable, <laughs> grouchy. Like, and then I'm gaining weight. Uh-huh. And so once I started to realize I'm going to make this the new norm because it seems like it's the new norm, mm-hmm. life started getting back to better. Oh, that yeah. I think the getting admitting that you need a routine and then starting yes. to develop one makes a yes. big difference. Yeah. Um. In terms of you now are roommates with another uh, Bachelor Nation person. Uh-huh. You guys are all in each other's uh, social media all the time. Do you have like a secret code of conduct between all of you of like what you post about each other? <laughs> That's such a good question. Like the <laughs> homie Connor. I just because I yeah, I wonder if there's like an unwritten rule list somewhere for you guys. <laughs> there needs to be because my homie Connor, he had recorded something before mm-hmm. and he asked me a question. I'm like, bro, I'm not talking to you about it because you record <laughs> it, like, like this is gonna be everywhere. Hell yeah. no, I'm not about to do that. He got uh-huh. he, he thought he could like sweet talk me or like be charismatic. I'm like, nah, bro, it ain't happening. Like, I'm not. I'm not talking. About it, right? Like, I'm like you already know the answer. We talked about it off camera. Uh-huh. I'm not going to talk about something with you, rather than talk to it with anyone uh-huh. else. Like, no. That's so I would great. say, this the way that I was on TV is the exact same way I am in real life. Mm-hmm. I'll just call you out. And be like, fuck no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> also, that bodes well for the living situation. I feel like you guys are. Uh, you have huge potential to prank each other constantly. No, that's going to happen. Oh, that should be Already. really fun. <laughs> um, also, in terms of reality TV, are there any other reality shows that you would go on or participate in? I really don't watch much TV. I know that you are in love with Real Housewives of New Jersey, right? Uh, all of them. Big fan of all of them. All yeah, of them. Melissa, too. That's what we were just catching up before you got here about Real Housewives. <laughs> but um, some recon right quick about you. Oh, but yeah, I, there you go. I mean, I would go on like if they had Fear Factor, if they brought that back, I would do that. Ah, oh, I could see that for sure. Yeah, I would love to do that. I'm not trying to like sign up to eat balls, but I would do Fear Factor. <laughs> Which is essentially uh, what you're doing if you sign up for Fear Factor. I feel like that has to be in their waiver that you're okay eating some animal's testicles at some point. <laughs> um, I would do like Survivor. Mm, uh, mm-hmm. Or if uh, no, I'm not going to say that one. That one I'm not going to bring up. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Never mind. No follow-up questions there. Perfect. Uh, would you ever do like Amazing Race or anything like that? I would do that. 100%. And who would you have as your partner? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't, I haven't found the person because they have to be extremely intelligent and extremely like positive. Yeah, pa- like patience is major. Yeah, they can't be like some negative Nancy. I can't deal with that. Uh uh-uh. uh. I'm like. Get out of here. I don't know. That's a good question. That's a real good question. Think on it. Think on it. Okay. We're going to take one last break. We have a bunch of Twitter questions for you when we get back. So we'll be right back with more Not Too Deep.
All right, Mike, we're back. Before we get into these Twitter questions, I'm going to ask you the two questions I ask every single guest that is on the podcast. And the first is, who, alive or dead, would you most like to throw cold spaghetti at? <sighs> yeah. Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know. There's no real other answer these days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I like the question. I would love to see that happen too. I think that'd be really good promo for your book. And I think you would uh, help a lot of people out. Uh, okay. The other question I ask every single guest is to tell us your worst pants shitting story or a like bathroom close call, but you can only use, uh, you can only use three words or three small phrases or like some combination. So for example, mine is college jogging front lawn. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it just happened the other day. Oh, say, <laughs> oh no. Okay. <laughs> this happened like two weeks ago. Perfect. I would say mine would be Texas summer heat. Oh, no. <laughs> outside. Uh, ran out of gas. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if ran out of gas is a metaphor or not, but... <laughs> Uh, no follow-up questions there. Okay, uh, we have some Twitter questions for you. Our first one, Melissa wants to know, does your back still hurt from carrying the season? Uh, wow, and I like wow. I like that tweet very much because, yeah, that resonates. Wow, wow, wow. wow. <laughs> Did you guys- I didn't work at back today. <laughs> it's back day. Uh, I do like because you guys are all friends now for the most part, or you're all like you know on good terms with each other. When you guys left the show, were you all on good terms, or was it kind of all over the place? Um, when we as immediately after leaving the show, I was pretty much cool with everybody except for like two people. Right. Okay. So I have no. I had no black. I still don't have bad blood with nobody. That's great. I mean, that's why your shoulders and back must be so tired from carrying everyone. Uh, okay. A lot of people are asking about the uh, Demi Lovato situation. What about? Uh, I have no, I have no knowledge of it. Is this a thing or is this a mysterious? Um, if we're going to speak of her, I would say congratulations to her. Okay. Yeah. Okay. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> A uh, favorite restaurant in San Antonio? Saluna. Saluna. Mm. They got some really good margaritas up at Saluna. Okay. Like, and, and El Mirasol. They got two El Mirasols, but I, I like the OG original El Mirasol. El okay. Mirasol. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Once restaurants. They're, they're chicken. They're, oh, my God. They, uh, they, got, this, <laughs> they got this mole. This uh, like, chocolate mole is so good. <laughs> Yeah, you look like you went to a different place in your head. <laughs> okay, so, yeah. uh, okay, someone wants to know, what was it like trying to date and socialize after The Bachelorette? I imagine there's like a little bit of a wonky period right after getting used to people watching you date on television. I mean, again, to me, like if I were to ask a lady on a date, I'm, I'm treating you with everything I'm giving you, I'm treating mm -hmm. you like, you know, gold, right? Mm -hmm. I don't, I'm, I might tell you, I might say this one time, I might say, hey, those pictures, those people over there are taking pictures of us. Okay. But that's it. Like, and I'm, and I'm right back to you. Mm. That, to me, I mean, I'm just a human, right? I'm, I'm yeah. the same guy. Yeah. Not, you, yeah. you, you can't help the situation that you're in at this yeah. point. Yeah. Uh, but it also must be, do you ever get mistaken for other people? Um, Jake from State Farm. <laughs> Is that true? Really? <laughs> oh, that's incredible. Uh, that's very, very funny. Did people try and take a photo with you? Um, <laughs> no, in person, normally in person, like after a while, they'll figure it out. Unless yeah. I'm not smiling. The way okay. that I can walk around in person. It's like if I got a do rag on and I'm not smiling at all, no one knows. No one recognizes me. But when I wow. open my mouth and start smiling, it's a different story. Wow. So you must be able to go anywhere with this mask situation. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, okay, Molly wants to know weirdest behind the scenes moment that didn't air on The Bachelorette. Freaking half the guys running around naked, like, <laughs> like, bro, like some of these dudes be suspect. I'm like, what, what, what's going on? Like, homie, what's up? A little, a little wiggly thing hanging out. Like, <laughs> Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, because I you guys are all just like living on top of each other the whole time. So you get to see how people really are. Oh, that's very funny. A true fraternity. Uh, yeah. OK, someone wants to know if uh, he was stuck on a, a deserted island with three other people from the Bachelor franchise, who would they be and why? Demi Burnett, because she's freaking hilarious. Okay, she's just yeah. gonna, she's gonna be my entertainment. She's gonna be my TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> like she's just freaking hilarious. Then I would say, <laughs> I would say, I don't. I would, ugh, I'm not gonna say another girl. Um, <laughs> I would say Clay Harbor because he's like this ex NFL player that all he wants to do is work out. Okay. So like, he would keep me in shape. Gotcha. And then I would, I would, then I would say Dylan. I would say Dylan Barber because he's like my little brother. He's he's a little asshole that is funny, but also incredibly intelligent. And our conversations are great. Oh, that's sweet. I mean, that rounds out everyone. So all of your needs are met on this island. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, okay, last question. Kendall says, uh, how do I make sure I'm emotionally available to start dating again after ending a long-term relationship? I would, I would have to ask. I want follow-up questions. Uh, like, yeah. For the question. Like, <laughs> well, I think this could speak a little bit to your book, right? That you're teaching people to find like the power in themselves and find like the love for themselves. And I feel like if people are in a long-term relationship, a lot of their identity gets, you know, connected to that relationship. So when you're... I know that, I know that completely. Yeah. I know that when people say... Uh, People feel like they lost their, they lost them, they lost themselves, they lost their identity, they lost just oneself with them being in a relationship, mm-hmm. and that's why again it goes back to seriously. I, I'm gonna get this tatted on me. Like you can never make anyone else happy until you make yourself happy, right? Mm. So to the viewer, the Twitter viewer that asked that question, I would definitely say just. You will know once you are completely satisfied in your life mm. without anybody else. Mm-hmm. Like you're just you're just happy, you're content, you're satisfied with what you have going on right now. I think that's great. Yeah. Once you feel totally okay by yourself, that's usually a good sign that you can add someone else into the mix with you. I w- that is true, but then also, and this is my comical side, mm-hmm. but also very serious side. The issue with being single for too long is like you get stuck in your ways. Oh, true. Mm-hmm. Like you can get stuck in your ways. And so just be cognizant of that as well. That, I think that's great. Is there one major thing you want people to take away from your book when they read it? That, how do I pronounce your last name? Helbig. So you're a great motherfucking Helbig. <laughs> and I want you to say it with your chest poked out. I want everybody to read my book to say it and mean it, and own it, and know it. Wow. I felt that. That was very powerful. (laughs) (laughs) My book book is extremely powerful. Oh, that's so wonderful. Well, Mike, we've reached the end of the podcast, but before we wrap everything up, uh, I know this is so wonderful, and I appreciate it, and I feel like I've learned so much. Um, Usually when we do the podcast in person, we have a a little gift for our guests for making time for us, and uh, because we're doing it, digitally we have a virtual gift for you we have a personalized fortune cookie from us to you i did find it okay okay let's see what your what your future holds <laughs> i'm just smiling already okay. we predict we predict great success for your book making the love you want however at least two percent of those people will only read the title and mistake it as a book about <laughs> baking cookies when you're sad yeah <laughs> So be careful. Be careful. I think now, if I do a virtual book tour, I should definitely have some cookies mm-hmm. right, as I read parts of the book. There you Melissa, go. I like that. I like that. <laughs> um, I like 
Now, Mike, where can people get your book? Uh, where can they find you on social media if they don't already know everything that you're up to? Yes. So you go to social media. My IG is Mike underscore Johnson. Uh, my website is where you can pre-order the book, MikeJohnsonSmile.com. If you don't necessarily want to, you're uneasy if you want to get the book, you can go to my website and just sign up for the newsletters. Tomorrow, our newsletters start once a week. I'm going to be sending out a personal newsletter and also a mantra mm-hmm. with the book. So therefore, it you know, builds that anticipation up. And Facebook, don't find me on there. I don't know how people find me on there. <laughs> Like, I'm like, no. And That's then great. Twitter, Mike Johnson one underscore. Love so again, it. Yes, Mike underscore Johnson, MikeJohnsonSmile.com. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Go get this book. Go change your life. Go get yourself pumped. You are motherfucking filling your name there. Mike, thank you so much for being here for this episode of Not Too Deep. This was so wonderful. And we'll see you guys next time. Goodbye. Thank you. Sweet. Too deep, too deep, too deep, not too deep. deep. It's Grace Helbig. Not Too Deep is a production of Grace Helbig Incorporated. Producer Melissa D. Montz, edited by Shireen Lani Yunus. Post-production sound by Chris Henry. And an extra special thanks to Flula for the theme music. (laughs) 